how significant are the measures that the BOJ has taken? Can the BOJ really move the dial here? Or, or, or is the market's expectation really more of a fiscal nature? Yeah, I don't think it really moves the dial on anything. They're, they're removing a constraint that wasn't biting to begin with. Um, uh, under yield curve control, they effectively have a commitment to buy unlimited amounts to hit the yield curve target. Um, they've had to buy substantially less than that because they already own so much of the market. So I think they're, you know, given that they've done so much, it's difficult through signaling and forward guidance to really uh, try to get the market to move even more. And, you know, obviously this doesn't, it doesn't hurt. It aligns them, I think, with some of the other central banks, but I don't really think it matters. What do you expect from the ECB and the Fed coming up, Aaron? I mean, are they going to do more or is it is it now time to, to really allow fiscal action to take hold? Um, well, so the ECB, I think, is, uh, you know, there's a possibility that we get a tweak on their tiering mechanism because they've been increasing excess liquidity in the system very substantially. So they might exempt a little bit more of the bank deposits from that um, uh, from their, their threshold at which they charge these punitive negative rates. That's possible at this meeting. We, we think it's also possible they delay that until June, but that, that's certainly possible. I think other than that, there's really not much to expect. I think the focus at the ECB is going to be around some of Lagarde's comments about the you know, minus 15% growth rate for Europe, which is basically vastly uh, worse than anybody's forecasting. So, um, uh, so I think that's relatively uneventful. I think the, the, the Fed, likewise, is, is currently still in emergency mode, so they – I think are going to make some significant changes probably at the June meeting where I think they move to a form of yield curve control as well. They, they change the QE program and they roll out some new forward guidance. But I think it's a bit early for that. I think that this meeting is focused on uh, may, dramatically changing the statement. Uh, you, you recall the last statement thought the labor market was still in good shape. That clearly is no longer the case. So I think, that, I think mm. the, the, the press conference and the meeting will focus mostly on sort of what they've done and explaining it. Yeah. And what do you expect from unemployment rates in Europe then? The pre-existing mm -hmm. protection for workers, perhaps very different in parts of the Eurozone versus the United States. So, so do you expect unemployment rates in Europe to get as high as those in the US, Aaron? What's your expectation? Yeah, so nothing like that. So, so we think the uh, European unemployment rate maybe goes up uh, to something like 10.5%. So a uh, two and a half percentage point increase or so over uh, where it came from. Whereas in the U.S., of course, we're, we're you know, we think we're going to peak at 16.7. So um, completely different employment outlooks. And, and what that is uh, reflecting is, I think, the job retention schemes, which in Europe at least seem to be working. So uh, our, our current count is that just for Germany, France and Spain, we've already got 28 million workers uh, in those uh, short term schemes, the, the furlough schemes in the U.K., which is actually not part of that number, but it's, it's a scheme like that, the Kurzarbeit in Germany. There are more people that have entered those schemes the last five weeks and have been laid off in the U.S. So I think that is very, very positive for, on a relative basis at least, for the European employment outlook.